Dreams are strange things. Their purpose is debated. Therapy, some say. We process deep emotions in dreams. Fight or flight training is another theory. A function of memory, even. But definitely, dreams are out of one's control. <laughs> I'm not a psychologist. I'm a king. And one night, I had a dream that was beyond those purposes and beyond my control. I first thought it was just a nightmare, but it was a dream sent from God. In 586 BC, Israel's southern kingdom was destroyed, its people sent into exile in Assyria. From that point forward, one of the main purposes of the prophets was to encourage the Israelites, assuring them that they would one day return to Israel. I was the king of Babylon, an ancient city located near modern Baghdad, Iraq. The Assyrians had been the dominant power in the region until the Babylonians defeated them in 612 BC. 26 years later, we again defeated Judah and abducted all the people, <clears throat> relocated all the people to Babylon. Does this sound cruel to you? Essentially kidnapping an entire people group, taking them far from their homeland. We learned to do this from the Assyrians. When you remove a conquered people from their homelands and traditional cultures, it almost eliminates the chance of revolt. It's crowd control. When we conquered the Assyrians, we did to them what they taught us. And they uh, virtually ceased to exist. As the king who conquered Judah, I removed all valuable articles from the temple and placed them in the temple of my God, Marduk, the preeminent god over all gods. Ah, <clears throat> the dream. One night I had a very troubling dream. I called for my magicians, astrologers, all my men of wisdom. They, of course, asked to hear my dream, and then they would interpret it. Trickery. I shouted. They were trying to trick me. I commanded them to tell me what my dream was first, and then tell me what it meant. If they could not meet my demands, all of them would be executed. It quickly became apparent they could not meet my demands. No one can do this, they said. I commanded the mass execution of all the wise men in Babylon. My men came to arrest Daniel. Using his wisdom and brilliance, quite honestly, he somehow convinced them and me to give him a little more time to meet my requirements. Daniel went straight to his friends, straight into prayer to their God. That night, his God revealed the mysterious dream and its meaning to him. The next morning, Daniel came into my court. Can you tell me my dream and what it means? I demanded. Daniel did the strangest thing. He gave glory to his God and made sure that I knew his knowledge came from his God, not himself. He proceeded to tell me about my dream. There was a, a giant statue with a head of gold, chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron and feet of iron and clay. He described a stone that destroyed the statue and then grew to be a mountain. Hearing the details of the dream reawakened all of my dread. I hadn't told a soul about the dream. His knowledge was divinely inspired by a powerful God, and I knew it. 
he he then revealed that the gold head represented my government and the other portions of the statue represented kingdoms that would follow me. I knew that his interpretation was true. I threw myself on the floor in front of him. I gave his God honor and glory. I immediately placed Daniel over all of Babylon and its wise men. I made his three friends administrators over the kingdom. My kingdom grew swiftly. I became the most powerful and wealthy man in the entire known world. It went to my head. I ordered a gold image to be made, 90 feet high. I had it placed in the plain of Dura. It was an image of my God. I ordered all the men in positions of power in my kingdom to attend its dedication. And then, another order. When the music began, all of the men in powerful positions and all the people, regardless of their nation or language, were to fall and worship to the image. The music began. Everyone in attendance bowed. Everyone, except the three friends of Daniel. I was furious. I summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you do not bow and worship my God, I will have you burned to death. They didn't bat an eye. Without hesitation, they defied me. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from you. But if not, you should know that we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you have raised. Insolence. I went berserk. I ordered the furnace heated to seven times hotter than its normal temperature. I ordered the three rebels to be tied up right there, while in their robes, trousers, and turbans, the three rebels would be burnt to a crisp in an instant. There was no way I would miss that moment of satisfaction. My soldiers threw them into the fire. The flames were so hot, it killed the soldiers. I couldn't believe my eyes. We had only thrown three men in the furnace. I saw four figures walking around in that fire, unbound and unarmed, a fourth person who looked like a son of the gods. I, I shouted for them to, to come out of the fire. All of my officials watched. The three men came out of the fire. No sign of burns, no singed hair, no scorched clothing. They didn't even smell of smoke. This was the work of a god. No, their god. I ordered that people throughout my kingdom respect their god, because no other god could have saved people in this way. I promoted Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to very high positions. Daniel spent virtually his entire adult life serving in the court of Babylon. He interpreted my dreams whenever I asked. He uh, even served me faithfully during my period of insanity. I lived outside, ate grass. When my sanity was restored, he guided me to praise God and be humble. You think the politicians in your day are petty and vicious? <laughs> you should have seen my life. I was a victim of the first wave of deportations of Jews from Judah to Babylon. I lived in Babylon almost 70 years, long enough to see the Babylonians defeated by the Persians. I could not possibly have survived a day without totally trusting God. He is the one who is in control 
I'm his instrument. I trusted him, and he made sure I survived and thrived. Governments, regime changes, don't really face him. I served four rulers, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Belshazzar of Babylon, Darius of Persia, and Cyrus of Persia. Darius of Persia, the third of those rulers, was the conqueror of Babylon. He appointed 120 officials to rule over his kingdom, with three men over those 120. I was one of the three, so you can imagine that I had at least 40 men gunning for my job at any one time. Through God's power, I was good at my job. So good that Darius wanted to promote me over everyone, second only to him. <laughs> Make that 122 men trying to undermine me and most likely do me harm. My administration was so efficient and full of integrity that they knew they couldn't find any charge against me unless they played the religion card. And knowing my devotion and habits, it didn't take them too long to play that card. They convinced Darius that no one should pray to any god, but instead pray to him. For 30 days, upon pain of death, Darius, he was prideful. He loved that idea and decreed it so. In his own mind, he had become a god, much like the Egyptian rulers believed themselves to be gods. You would think he would have asked my advice over such a matter, but he knew I would have advised against it, and he desperately wanted people praying to him. Oh, <laughs> that's not all. His decree could not be repealed even by him. He didn't really think that through, though. Pride again? Upon learning of the ridiculous decree, I went home and did what I always did. I opened my upstairs window. It faced the direction of Jerusalem. And I prayed. I did this three times a day, you know. From the courtyard below, I was visible. Just the proof my enemies hoped for. The 122 men sprung their trap and went straight to the king. Checkmate. The king's trusted right-hand man was condemned by a royal decree. There was no way to reverse. For hours, the king tried to find a workaround. At sundown, he was forced to declare my death. I had disobeyed his decree. I could hear the men coming long before they got to me. They found me still dressed in royal garments, complete with jeweled sandals. That finery clashed with the dirty, pitch-dark pit that they threw me into. A huge stone was rolled over the pit's small opening. The king and officials sealed it with wax, and to be official, impressed their rings done. Dead. In the darkness, I couldn't see the lions. I could hear them. I could feel their breath. There were many lions in the den. I knew that much. And none of them had been fed for many days. The next morning, a stone was rolled back. A living person emerged from that certain grave, much like Lazarus would centuries later. The king stayed up all night worrying about me. It's what you do when you come face to face with the fact you aren't in control. Worry. He came near to the opening. Daniel. His voice had little hope. Servant of the living God. Has your God been able to save you from the lions? I waited a few seconds to build suspense. God's angel shut the mouths of the lions 
I called back. I was not hurt because I was innocent in his eyes. I've never done you any wrong. The king ordered for me to be lifted out. He was overjoyed. I didn't even have a scratch. Without looking at a single one of them, the king ordered my enemies to be thrown into the den with their wives and children. The lions crushed their bones before their bodies hit the ground. I gave a prophecy about a vision of four beasts. Like the prophetic interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream, this prophecy had to do with future kingdoms. Many believe I was predicting the kingdoms Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. Some believe I was also predicting the kingdoms of Jesus Christ and or a future kingdom at the end of the ages. I do want to talk about one more prophecy, one made not by me, but by Jeremiah. I was reading the words of Jeremiah, which I consider to be scripture, and understood that the captivity of Jerusalem would last 70 years. By my calculation, that meant the exile of the Jews would soon be over. Rather than celebrating that joyous news, I went to the Lord in prayer and petition, fasting and uh, in sackcloth. It's what prophets did to show humility before God. I asked that we be allowed to return to our country so we could serve him in his sanctuary, in Jerusalem, his holy city. I asked, not for our sakes, but for his. We were his people. We carried his name. My gracious God allowed me to live long enough to see the Jews begin to return to Jerusalem in 538 BC. That's when I came to more fully understand my role. My friends and I had been placed in authority that lasted through Babylon's reign and into Persia's long reign. We played a large part in protecting the Jews and keeping them faithful to God. We even helped protect the articles from the temple that the Babylonians had stolen. When the Jewish exiles left to return to Jerusalem, we sent 5,400 temple articles back to the temple with them. We were instruments in God's hands. Our job was to stick with him do anything he asked, even when we didn't understand it, even when our lives were at stake. God was the one in control the entire time. And guess what? He still is.